I want us to start today when you've made a decision or almost made a decision. Maybe you didn't end up doing it, but you're a follower of God and you ended up cheating. Yeah, that's cheating in an exam, say. I mean, perhaps you lent on somebody else's work in an exam or an assignment. Um, Perhaps you rationalised at the time, thinking, I just won't get through if I I don't, and there was so much pressure, but you pushed that thought away and you did it, you did your own thing. Or or, or perhaps, perhaps it was the lie that you told at work, whether it was a lie to a client or a lie to a boss or a lie to an employee. Uh, maybe it was why the thing had not been done that you promised would be done by the particular time in the particular way. I mean, you were so under pressure and, and it would have been completely awful if they'd found out how much you'd messed it up. And it just seemed better at the moment in the, right in that time to cover it with a lie. And you went your own way and you did your own thing. Or... Or perhaps it was money. I mean, you rationalised. It was only a little bit, really, that the tax department missed out on. And it's faceless, it's the government. Or, and I tried not to think about what was... Fa- I, I mean, I was just so under pressure in, in our family situation and, and no one would know. And you did your own thing. Or perhaps it's money in terms of church. And you pretend as you engage in the discussions that we have around here and you pretend that you're right on board with what is happening here and how to use the money and how the church is using money and you pretend that you're right with us but you know in your heart that there's been decision after decision where you haven't lived with your wallet, lived with your purse as, you've, as God would have you live and you've gone your own way and you, you fudge and you rationalise but... Or, and for some of us, it's sex. I mean, I mean, God's been clear. The place for sexual activity is in the covenant of marriage, post the wedding day, with your spouse. And you know in your heart that's right. But, and you're feeling the pressure and you don't want to lose the other person and, and it just seems best to do it your own way. Now, if you are a follower of God, and I'm not assuming that everybody here is, but if you are a follower of God and you go your own way and you do your own thing and, you know, if if you're a follower of God, it's only when I'm really under pressure that I can really see where I stand where really I am when I'm when the fulcrum is actually on me and I'm I'm going to fail if I don't or I'm going to miss out or it's not going to work out it just seems like it's going to be a disaster if I don't take things into my own hands I want us to pick up this morning in 1 Samuel 13 and you need to have 1 Samuel 13 open to check what I am saying is what the scriptures are saying this morning. And and after the last few weeks through 1 Samuel, we've seen God give Saul, the king, this really amazing privilege and amazing responsibility. And he's chosen by the God of the universe to be the king of his people, to be God, king, people, God's king under him, to rule under God. And we saw for a while there was an option that the people were thinking of a king independent from God. And And then God has given them a king who would be under me. And that's what we saw. Samuel gave the speech last week and we come to chapter 13 today and we've seen the prophet Samuel kind of move off the centre stage to make way for the new king, to make way for Saul. And and actually, just one more little bit of background before we get into the detail this morning. A few chapters ago, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, and you might want to just flick back to chapter 10, in 1 Samuel 10 we learned about this neighbouring threat from the country, the Philistines, and um, 1 Samuel 10 verse 5, after that, Samuel speaking to Saul, you'll come to the hill of God, where are the Philistine garrisons? 
when you arrive at the city, you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place prophesying. They'll be preceded by harps and tambourines and flutes and lyres. The Spirit of God will control you. You'll prophesy with them. You'll be transformed into a different person. When these signs have happened to you, do whatever your circumstances require. God is with you. I take it means take them on, defeat them. Afterwards, go ahead of me to Gilgal. I'll come to you and offer burnt, sacri- burnt offerings and sacrifice fellowship offerings. Wait seven days until I come to you and show you what to do. Two instructions from the king. First, deal with the Philistine. Two instructions from the prophet of God to the king. Deal with the Philistine problem. That's what God wants you to do. And secondly, wait. I'll come to you afterwards and I'll offer the burnt offerings and the fellowship uh, sacrifice. So we, we get to chapter 13 and Saul, immediately on his agenda, is to deal with the Philistine problem. But chapter 13, you want to flick forward those two pages to chapter 13, it, it seems like he's not going to do it God's way, he's going to do it his own way. And verse 1 of chapter 13, Saul was 30 years old when he became king. He reigned 42 years over Israel. Just, just for... Um, Transparency, there's a little, what they call a textual discrepancy in that verse. Um, Those numbers, 30 and 42, may not be, in fact, probably most likely aren't 30 and 42. Different commentators take different positions. There's all sorts of arguments, but the number 30 is not there in the best texts, and the number 40 40 is not there. It could be just a year and two years. In fact, um, a couple of the commentaries I read, um, and this is the position John Woodhouse takes, is that... Saul really took a year waiting to be king and then two years as king, that really he was only in the kind of centre stage for three years. And all the stuff of these chapters just takes place in those few years rather than in three, four decades. Now, it's disputed, different views, not a lot hangs on it, but I'm just, for the sake of transparency, letting you know that. Anyway, new king, Saul, puts together a standing army, three divisions of the standing army, Two with Saul, one with his son Jonathan. So sentence two, he chose 3,000 men from Israel for himself, the army. 2,000 were with Saul at Michmash and uh, in Bethel's hill country, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. Now, on the screen, we'll put up a map, and we'll go to the slightly smaller one, a slightly more close-up one. You can see um, Michmash there and Gilgal there. So, 2,000 were with Saul at Michmash, and 1,000 with Jonathan at Gilgal. Um, He sent the rest of the troops away, each to his own tent. Now, verse 3, Jonathan attacked the Philistine garrison that was in Gabeah. Now, where's Gabeah? There it is, just a little southwest of Michmash. And the Philistines heard about it. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine garrison, and Israel is now repulsive to the Philistines. The troops were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. So there's been a position swap, and Saul's moved over here to Gilgal. The Philistines gathered to fight against Israel. 3,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen and troops as numerous as the sand on the seashore. So the Israelites had 3,000 troops. The Philistines had as many troops as there is sand on the seashore. And now we've got the Philistines coming into Michmash and Saul's over at Gilgal. And Israel is vastly outnumbered. And the Israelites are terrified. The men of Israel, six, saw that they were in trouble because the troops were in a difficult situation. They hid in caves and thickets among rocks and in holes and cisterns. I want to draw the parallel as we go through life. We find ourselves in difficult situations. I don't know how we're going to pay the mortgage unless I take the money. Uh, I won't be able to hold the job together professionally 
unless I do a thing that I know I shouldn't. Uh, to, to stay in the relationship, I, I think I want to put out for that guy. It's a really bad situation and I rationalise it and say it's just a little lie. That's the, the mind game that goes on when we're really put under pressure. Anyway, the, the, the men of Israel hid. So instead of standing in their camp together, waiting to take action, they hid in the caves and the thickets among rocks and in holes and in cisterns. And, and some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan. So you can see the Jordan River there. Some of them even went to the other side of the Jordan, to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul, however... I'm still reading verse 7, was still at Gilgal. All his troops were gripped with fear. He waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set. But Samuel didn't come and the troops were deserting him. And you can imagine every day and every hour as more and more troops desert, more and more troops, I'm vastly outnumbered. I've got no chance of winning, it seems to him. And it just seems impossible. And what am I going to do? What is Saul going to do? He, he is so tempted to take things into his own hands and to not depend on God. Well, actually, really, when you compare this battle and the battle strategy here with the battle strategy of the battle we saw two chapters ago all along he's been taking things into his own hands and not depending on God he's been doing it his own way and and actually what Saul does here and we'll see it in a sec is just so much like Adam if you think back to the start of the Bible God says to Adam and to Eve you can eat from any fruit of the tree any 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 tree of the garden anyone you like but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and Adam says, you know, I want to do what I want to do and I'm, I, I don't particularly care what you say, God. And Saul, he's right under pressure. But he says, I want to do what I feel I need to do. And I'm not listening to you, God. I'm not listening to the prophet Samuel, to God's prophet Samuel. And so whereas Samuel had said, wait for me, and when I come, I'll offer the offering. Saul says, verse 9, look what he says. Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. Then he offered the burnt offering. He doesn't wait like he was told to wait. He takes, he takes it on himself. He takes the role of God's man on himself. He does it himself. What Saul does actually is exactly what Adam does. He rationalizes it. I'm in a terrible situation. I had no other choice. I would have lost my job. I would have failed the course. I, I, I needed the money. The relationship would have been over. I would have lost the war. As soon as he finishes, Samuel walks in. Samuel arrives. Just as he finishes offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrives and is Saul went out to greet him. Samuel asked, what have you done? It's like God walking in the garden and Adam's there and he says, where are you? I heard, I was naked, I hid. Saul answered, when I saw the troops were deserting me and you didn't come within the appointed days and the Philistines were gathering at Michmash, I thought the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal and I haven't sought the Lord's favour. I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. The woman you put here with me, she gave it to me and I ate. You can hear yourself saying it to God, can't you? That terrible secret thing. I wasn't really rejecting you, God. I was, I was just saying that in this moment, I know better than you and I have a better plan for this situation and in the end, you don't know how to manage this situation and if I'd left it to you, the mess I'd be in would be even worse than I'm in. Right at this very moment in, in history, the Christian church faces a decision exactly like this. All around 
as the secular progressives are moving, and it, it, it's, it's like a tidal wave, actually. It, 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 and it's, you stand here as a member of the people of God and it feels like people are deserting God, deserting the king, fleeing to the mountains, hiding in the rocks, running over to the other side of the Jordan on the whole issue of sexuality. And will, will people choose to stand and do things God's way or will they abandon God's teaching? Um, the Church of England is, in England is just about to have a synod to decide whether or not we will obey God or whether we'll take it into our own hands. And everywhere around the cultural elites are saying, trust your common sense, take it into your own hands, don't wait till Samuel comes, don't wait another minute. And you, and you can hear people offering up their reasons. I had no choice but to move beyond Scripture to say that the Bible was wrong. It was, it was either say the Bible was wrong or everyone would think I was irrelevant. Or I had no other choice but to reinterpret the Bible and say it means what it cleanly doesn't. Or to say it was the best thing for God's people and God hadn't showed up and I just had to say this was the best way to go or... or Listen to what the prophet of God says to Saul at this point. The prophet of God says to the man of God, when the man of God says he knows better than God, this is what the prophet says. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you fool. You have been foolish. To be foolish here is not to be dumb. To be foolish here is to be morally degenerate. You have not kept the command which the Lord your God gave you. It was at this time the Lord would have permanently established your reign over you. If, if you'd followed him, if you'd walked in his ways, he would have permanently put you in charge. But now your reign, now your kingdom, now your dynasty will not endure. You see how the warning comes to you and me, Christian friend? I'm so tempted when I'm under pressure to think I know better than God. I mean, I'm just to steal a little of the thunder of later this morning as we come to the election and whether or not there's a plebiscite. And I'm just tempted to roll over and hide in the rocks going to lose anyway, run to the Jordan, safety, or on the homosexual thing, roll over, reinterpret scripture, roll over, be on the right side of history, don't want to go out on a limb and lose, it'll be worse than if I played hard and then lost, and the Philistines are everywhere and I'm outnumbered. But then just as my mind is running through all of that, I hear the voice of the prophet of God say, you fool, that would be a foolish way to go. Verse 13, you've not kept the command of God. Or, or what is it that you're challenged? What do you right before you that is a decision? Will I go your way? Will I go God's way? You don't want to hear the prophet of God say, you thief. You don't want to hear the prophet of God say, you liar. You cheat. You fool. And I don't want him to hear the prophet of God say, your kingdom won't endure. I mean, that is what... Samuel says to Saul, and so eventually David replaces Saul. The kingdom is given to someone else, and eventually it is King David's greater son, Jesus, who reigns eternally. The kingdom par, ex the king par excellence in the kingdom of God. Um, Jesus, he's the king who is after his father's heart. 
who walks in his father's ways, who follows in his father's footsteps. Uh, Let me give it to you from Hebrews, from Hebrews chapter 5. Listen to this. During his earthly life, this is Jesus, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears. That, that's the moment when Jesus was so under pressure. That's the moment when Jesus was tempted to take it into his own hands. That's the moment when everything was against him and it looked almost for sure that he was going to lose. Loud cries and tears he offers to the one who's able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Though he was God's son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. In that moment of being tempted, and it's right on the line, and will you go this way or will you go that way? Jesus learned obedience. And when it's for you, for me, and it's right on the line, and what am I going to do? Am I going to learn obedience? It's so attractive for Jesus to take the shortcut, to act his own way, to not follow the Father's plan. To, But in the end, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he died, sweating drops of blood, the Lord Jesus looks up to his Father and says, not my will, but your will be done. Just those sentences, just look at them there. Hebrews 5 verse 7. How hard it was for Jesus. How awful it was for Jesus. How he pleaded not to go through with it. And he was heard. But still the Father said, go to the cross. And in his death, Jesus secured salvation for those who trust him, those who obey him. In his death, Jesus saves us. You're here in this room. You know you've offended God. I mean, I mean, it was a lie, it was a cheat, it was a steal, it was a sex, it was cheap sex. But in the end it was, I don't care, God, I'm doing my thing. Not yours. And what you deserve is the eternal cutoff. That's all God. But we see in that line from Hebrews that Jesus is the source of eternal salvation. He died for us. There is a possibility. There's an opening. There's a, there's a reach out for forgiveness and receive it. Eternal life. Eternal forgiveness. Now saved, now forgiven, now accepted. How will I live? Will I keep on the pattern of doing my own thing, rejecting him, snubbing him, ignoring him, giving in to temptation? I want to say to us this morning, with all seriousness, the judgment on Saul is a warning to every one of us. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, he speaks about the people of Israel rebelling in chapter 10, and he he speaks of 24,000 of them dying in one day, and he says these things happened as a warning for us on whom the fulfilment of the ages has happened. I'll give it to you. Look at verse 11 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. These things happened as examples. They were written down as a warning to us. This incident in 1 Samuel 13 was written down as a warning. It's written down as a warning to us on whom the ends of the ages have come. Whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. I don't know about you, but I go through seasons of being really aware of the warning from God and really aware of the privilege that I have and really focused on living for him in obedience and then I slip into complacency. 
and then I slip into Paul. Whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your able, beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, he'll also provide a way of escape so that you're able to bear. You know, when, when everything's against me, when it just seems like I've got no option but to tell the lie, to offer the sacrifice, to cheat, to there's always another way out. That's what that verse is saying, verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10. It is never the case that I am able to say I had no option but to lie. I had to. There's always a different answer. It's never true to say I had no option other than to cheat. There's always a different answer. It's never true to say I had no other option but to hold back on the tax department. There's always a different answer. It's never true to say I had no other option but to hold back on giving to God. There's, there's always a different answer. There's always a way to be faithful. When I sin, I always jump. I am never pushed. When Saul sinned that day, he didn't have to. When he sacrificed that day, he didn't have to. There was a way out. There was a different answer. 